everyone welcome back to another episode of the innovators mindset podcast and i just wanted to do a solo podcast i wanted to just kind of share some thoughts uh some thinking some ideas and uh i'm, I'm recording this on a, a cloudy day here in edmonton alberta canada and really thinking about learning growth how important uh, those things are and really thinking about our own mental capacity uh, to deal with things that how really how connected our whole selves are to what we do in education that sometimes those outside factors that we have those outside relationships how they really affect the work that we do in education and that's just one thing that I'm thinking about today because really I've been trying to take better care of myself uh, and a lot of times people see you know what I share on Instagram or in my newsletter about my fitness journey but I think it's also just trying to take better care of myself mentally and emotionally. And I hope that wherever you are today and whatever you're doing, you're finding that space to uh, help yourselves to, you know, be better. I hope that in some ways I really try to share positive messages uh, in my podcast in these spaces because I know how hard things are for people and I want to be um, a light as much as I can, even though I deal with my own personal struggles to, to do that. And I think sometimes I try to be that light for others to help myself to feel better that maybe I can bring something positive, something uh, optimistic in, in our work today. So I, I just want to, first of all, thank you for being here because I know um, how, how much time your, your time matters and that you're spending with uh, me right now. Uh, is really important to me. So I just want to thank you. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually an older post that I wrote uh, titled uh, Five Ways We Can Influence Change in Education. And the reason I want to talk about an older post is because I actually updated it. And I updated when to look at the ideas that I shared. And now I called it Five Ways We Can Influence Meaningful Change in Education. Not just change because not all change is good, but meaningful, meaning positive uh, in, in the work that we do in education and why I wanted to kind of update it was to look at what was I talking about when I originally wrote this post in 2014 and how have my ideas changed, but also how have they stayed the same? Because I think a lot of times when we're talking in education, we, we have these mission and vision statements that we create that are really compelling and powerful and they say something beautiful and we have you know teams working together to you know wordsmith and, and just you know share these great ideas but do we go revisit them and ask like what does this mean today you know as our context change as our understanding of you know learning changes what what matters here so i wanted to kind of model that but i also wanted to share some of these five ways that that um you can really influence change in a positive way and the, the five uh, things that I shared in the original post uh, in order of this, model the change that you want to see, uh, show that you understand that value already exists, tell stories, bring it back to the kids, get people excited, and then get out of the way. So I'm going to talk about these five things and just kind of what the updated context is. And the, the first one I'm going to talk about is this idea of modeling the change that we want to see. So this is like a self-evident one. And Jimmy Cass, this very good friend of mine, uh, he's known for a quote is what we model is what we get. And I love that quote. And I think it's really powerful. But I think sometimes when people look at that quote, they believe what we model is what we should be getting immediately, right? That if I do this, you should be doing the same thing that I'm doing right now. And I look at my own career, how I kind of had this um, belief myself and how have I grown? How have I seeing that difference and i'll give you a really um you know example for my own growth and learning i remember actually you know basically getting onto social media seeing the power of it seeing how incredible it is and now i started doing it and i kind of had this expectation other people would do this as well because i was doing it i was seeing value um and so i would say things like um you know if, if you're if you're not using this you're going to become irrelevant really quick and I, I don't necessarily believe I don't necessarily believe that. I think we have to continuously grow. I think that's an important thing. But I don't think everyone has to be using Twitter. I don't think everyone has to use Voxer or you know jump on Clubhouse or things like that. I think it's really important that we learn to connect and network and find spaces outside of our immediate communities to learn from other people around the world. And I think it's really valuable. 
But, you know, at the time that I was saying that, my brother, Dr. Alec Kroos, was, you know, on my case for five years. He was modeling it, saying I should do this, and I, I just wasn't ready. And now kind of understanding that some of the people that I work with, um, they've jumped on and maybe encouraged people like, you need to get on because I'm seeing the value of this too. But where were you when I started? Where was I when my brother was coaxing me to do the same thing? So I think the updated version of like what we model is what we get is, you know, and we got to model the change that we want to see. I think it's really important to understand that that is like, let's lead by example, but understand that people are in different spaces and they might not be ready to jump on when you're jumping on. And I'll, I'll give you an example of something that um, I'm obviously people know I'm really focused on my, my, my mental and physical health, my fitness. Uh, I'm really trying to uh, get back into better shape than I, which I kind of let go to be honest with you. And I remember um, one time I was uh, at a conference and someone said, Hey, let's go running for like 10 miles. I'm like, I, Hey, look, I've started running, but I can't do this. And they had been doing it. They were coaxing me. And, and ultimately I was not at that place where I could have done what that person had, had accomplished on that day. And even though they were running and I knew I should try more, I wasn't in a shape that I could have done that. And I think that I would have felt more demotivated uh, and maybe stepped away from it totally if I would have tried something that I knew I just wasn't ready for in that day. And it wasn't that I didn't see the value in it. I wasn't ready at that time for several factors, for things maybe going on in my life, for where my my physical wellness was. And of course, they were living this very healthy lifestyle. And when I talk about my health, I don't ever try to share like, this is what you should do. I just say, hey, these are the things that I'm doing right now. And here's how they benefited me. If you can take anything and learn from that, go for it. But I understand that everyone's in a different context. And I think we have to apply that to different things. I'm a big advocate of innovation and education. But if I don't see people doing the things that I'm doing, I don't think they're less innovative. I try to understand that they're in different spaces. And I continuously model what I hope to see. And I try different things. But we have to understand that people are at different spaces. And yes, you can model it. But I understand there are things you do today you swore you would never do. Why didn't you start them earlier? You just weren't ready at that time. And that's okay. And we have to give that same grace uh, to others. And I think that leads to the second one beautifully is show that, show that you understand that value already exists. A lot of times we can talk about change. Like we need to change things. But what's good? What's already good in that space? And I say this to people all the time that if you go into a, an organization, maybe as an administrator, as a new principal, and you are trying to change everything right away, people will not respond well if they feel you are trying to fix them. They will, they will push back tremendously. But if you get into a space where you actually are, know people's strengths are valued, they know that their strengths are valued by you, and that you're trying to help them grow from a place of strength, then they're going to be with you that, that whole way. They're going to be able to connect with you and actually um, not just be valued, but feel valued. And uh, a strategy I've shared before, but I think it's worth hearing and something you can apply you know, as an educator in your classroom is that if you're new to a building, uh, I would encourage you to make a spreadsheet of every person you know that, that's on your staff and then to the right with their names, say, what are they good at? Like, what is their strength? And until they know you can identify that, don't change anything. Because as I said earlier, if you're trying, if people think you're trying to fix them, they're going to fight you the entire way. And so when we say model the change we want to see, yeah, we can, we're, we're at a certain place because of things that we've done, uh, things that we are ready for. But it doesn't mean that people that aren't doing what you're doing aren't actually providing something of value. I started looking at, hey, here are the things that I bring to the table, but I got to find what other people are bringing. I got to find what, you know, students in my classroom are bringing to the, you know, to our classroom, to our community as well. And so starting from that place of strength doesn't mean that you're ignoring weaknesses. It's just starting from a place of value. And the third one was tell stories. When we, when I look back at, when we talk about this idea of like driving meaningful change, uh, Dan Pink talks about this idea of how there's so much information in the world, 
And so how do we get ideas to stick? How do we get ideas to resonate? And that human connection is so imperative. And as, as much as I'm known for innovation in education, I'm not against traditional practice. I, I have no problem with it. I have a problem with bad practice, right? And I think we can have a conversation on what, you know, is bad practice. And some practices that might work for one student might not work for an, another, whether it's new or old and vice versa. So it doesn't mean it's bad if it's traditional. It doesn't mean if it's good, it's if it's new. But I think the reason I bring this up is that I always talk about innovation, but I, I encourage telling stories, which is probably the oldest practice of teaching and learning ever and how important that is. And so it's not, like I said, traditional is not a bad thing. So when I talk about leading change through stories, I think you we try to tell stories where people see themselves in that story that there's a connection to that and I, I was just able to have a podcast recently and uh the the gentleman I talked to and I, and I apologize because I can't remember exactly who it was but they were saying before the conversation that they noticed a lot of the people that they would listen to had these stories of like you know doing something amazing science you know in, in the field of science or winning an Olympic medal and they're like hey that's awesome but there's a lot more people who don't do those things. And do I see myself in that? Do I see myself in that space? And so I think, you know, we could tell our stories of like overcoming over, you know, over, um, you know, achieving, doing some great things. But I think you want to tell stories where people relate and connect with you. And when you're looking at the last, you know, 18 months or so of education, um, I think a lot of the stories in education were being told by people outside of the practice who have never been in the field. Um, of what you know their their perception is and I think as educators as leaders in education there are so many different ways we can tell our stories whether through uh, video uh, through uh, uh, you know different mediums podcasting things like that do we tell those stories but not only do we have opportunities to tell stories through different mediums we actually have opportunities to tell stories through you know different people in organization and it doesn't always have to be the superintendent that has this you know beautiful uh studio set up with the you know nice soft lighting and all of that stuff it can come from our kids it can come from our staff it can come from our you know families and our community and i think that the more you tap into the best resource we have in our schools which is our people uh, and get them to tell the stories, the more your message gets out and the more people want to be a part of that, the more people want to do this. So uh, Joe Sanfilippo, he, par- and I, I, I'm, I don't know if this is originally from him, but I've heard him say it several times, is basically if you don't tell, it, or sorry, in the absence of information, people will make up their own. And so we have to take ownership of those stories, tell what's happening in our schools and share them because I think there's so many valuable things that we need to connect And this, this leads to the next one. Number four, bringing it back to the kids. Uh, I know that uh, I wasn't necessarily the best teacher. I tried to be a good teacher. I'm very proud of my career. And as an administrator, I was very new, didn't have experience. And I think that a lot of people question like, hey, who is this guy? What does he know about admin? He can't have been teaching that long. And I felt that I actually gained a lot of credibility with the staff early on because they saw me spending recess with students they saw me out in the hallways having conversations and they said okay maybe this guy doesn't know that much maybe he's new and he'll grow but we at least know his heart is in the right place and and i've always focused on this and i think moving backwards from there and i think we have a lot so if you're going into new school uh, i think for me one of the most important things when i look at administrators superintendents do they even care about the students they serve do they care about their staff do they care about their colleagues and if you if you display that you know in different ways i think people actually connect it but when you look at initiatives of things that you do in your work um, is it more about the adults or is it more about the kids now i'm not saying ignore the adults but And I have really kind of changed my thinking on this. I used to always focus on like, say like, hey, we need to focus on what's best for kids. But that should not be the to the detriment of staff. In fact, when you serve your staff to help kids, that's actually better for kids. I think that's a really important aspect that we we tend to, to, to leave out. But when you're looking at the work to use, so for example, let's say you have a professional learning day. 
uh, whatever you're learning about, can you talk about how this will actually help student learning? How is this going to improve our school communities? Can you identify that? Or is it for something else? And I think that if we always have this, and I would have some conversations, tough ones with parents, and you could kind of feel it getting heated. And one of the centering questions or things that I would say is like, hey, you and I are here to do what's best for your child, correct? And I make them answer that so they can see that I, I'm not here to work against you. I'm here to work with you. But people need to know we are here for the right reasons, that we're here for the kids. So I think that's a really important aspect. And then ultimately, when we're talking about driving meaningful change, when we get people really excited, we have to get out of their way. It, it, it's easy to get people excited and then start trying to control their actions after, trying to get them to do things that, you know, the way we want them to do it or exactly this way. And here's something that I know is that the more you micromanage, and this is at every level, this includes classroom teachers, uh, administrators, superintendents, every level, the more you micromanage, the more work it is going to be for you. And ultimately, do you create a space where it is dependent on the work that you do solely? And what I mean by that is if you do all the things, if you jump in and, and you take over, you get people to do things exactly the way that you want them to do, what happens when you leave? What happens when you move on? What happens when you leave that classroom? What happens to your students when they go into the next classroom where they're expected to be more independent, they're more empowered? And a lot of you know um, schools that I work with, they're trying to get things, kids to do you know really creative, innovative things. And sometimes they'll say, just give me the test. Just give me the test. And that's one of the frustrations that we have. And so we, we create these visions together and we get excited about it. But do you actually let people get, you know, have some say in the way that it's going on? Uh, not only the, the vision, but the process of how we do these things. It's really easy to try to control everything, but it's a lot more work. And it's not better for the people we serve, which to me is, you know, we have to get people excited about this. So revisiting these five ways we can drive meaningful change in education. And the first one is model the change that we want to see. So that's really important. But understand that people are at different times, you know, in their lives, in their experiences. And we need to honor that. We need to make sure that we know there's things that we've grown in. There's times where we weren't ready and people gave us the grace and we need to do the same thing for others. Um, the second one is show that you understand that value already exists. Uh, of course, we want people to grow. Of course, we want people to get better. We have to display that ourselves, but also start from a place of strengths. Don't focus on what people can't do because already you limit them. What are they doing really well? And start from that place of strength. The next one is tell our stories. Our stories are so more important to driving change, but don't just think about where you're telling your stories but also think about who do we tap into to share these stories, the different experiences from different people in our schools and our communities. That's really important. The second one is bring it back to the kids. Why do we do what we do? I think that if you want people to get behind change, especially educators who love kids, who did this because they wanted to change trajectories, if we always go back and remind us of why we're here, it's going to be so much easier to move people forward. And then the last one, get people excited and get out of the way. We really want to talk about empowerment, but empowerment doesn't mean micromanaging. We can create these visions together. We can do some really compelling things in our work, but we have to trust the people that we have, you know, put in front of our kids that we've, you know, have in our communities to do these incredible things that we want them to not only see themselves in the vision, but they own the process and the journey because when we do this together when we have some say then the school it's not just about our classroom anymore it's about the school doing well as a whole i just wanted to share those five things but i also wanted you to think about um how you've grown like taking something that you wrote previously uh something you wrote or maybe shared a long time ago revisit it and say like hey what has changed what has stayed the same i think it's a really valuable practice it's one of the reasons i love blogging and so i, I appreciate you here to this time I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I hope whatever you're doing right now, it's filling you up. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.